the authority to sue. A study to be released tomorrow says that the number one health concern in America is not the cost of health care or heart disease or even AIDS. Throughout the country, the most pressing health concern among all age groups is violence. Tonight, our medical correspondent, Dr. Brian McDonough, begins a five-part series entitled The Cost of Violence. Doctor? Well, Rich, that survey crossed all lines, gender, racial, and ethnic. It is a reflection of the fact that we as Americans are aware that violence is a very real threat that can occur at any time. And violence can affect the health of anyone in any age group. Take the story of this 15-year-old from Levittown. I want to fight them. They all came up and jumped me. It was a senseless act of violence that has left permanent scars, but it was not an isolated event. Every kid hospitalized for violence costs about $14,000. Now, $14,000 may not seem like a lot to some people. It may seem like a lot to other people. But if you look at the number of kids who go into the hospital because of violence, there are a lot. It cost this nation billions of dollars to have kids put in the hospital because of violence. In seven states, the death rate from firearms in people 18 to 24 now equals the death rate from motor vehicle accidents. We're definitely seeing an increase in the incidence of violence in association with catastrophic disability, like tra traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury, secondary to bullet wounds or stabbings. He was on his way home from playing Nintendo at a friend's home when he was spotted by a group of teenagers. An argument and a fight ensued, and Larry Morris was beaten and kicked in the head. Now it's harder because you don't have as much coordination, so you really have to concentrate more. 15-year-old Larry Morris is making a remarkable recovery. On November 19th, while on his way to get ice cream, he was beaten by a gang of teens. Despite being hit repeatedly in the head, he made it home to his family. His one eye, which I, I believe was like totally dilated by the time the ambulance and everything, but started looking funny. That's why we were like joking when I'm saying, oh, you're out drinking with the guys. And the dilated or enlarging pupil was a sign of increased pressure in his skull. In fact, it is the foremost warning sign of impending brain damage unless treated. Larry was kicked in the left side of the head, and as a result, a slow bleed occurred that expanded in his skull. With nowhere to go, the blood pressed his brain into the other side of the skull. Larry... Um, had what we call an epidural hematoma, um, meaning that the, uh, a specific artery in his head once injured bled. It had to be stopped. This procedure, called a burr hole, is the most common way to treat an epidural. When people commit violent acts, they rarely see the intricate medical complications. This is left for the family. Larry's mother thought her son would be fine after surgery. She was wrong. And the nurse said, come out here, I want to talk to you. And she said, he's in a coma. And I was like, oh, my God. Larry's entire left side was paralyzed, and he didn't wake up for 12 days. But with rehabilitation therapy, he's making a slow recovery. He can't run or jump yet, and his left side is still weak. But he remembers how to shoot a basketball. Larry has other problems, perhaps greater than the weakness. There was more damage than just from the bleeding. Um, there's what we call contusional injuries when the brain slides along the skull. And that happens mostly in the areas called the frontal lobes and the temporal lobes. Um, our frontal lobes are responsible for um, so, what we call socially appropriate behavior. He just keeps going and going, and, and he's not embarrassed about things that would normally embarrass him. You watch him cross the street, and he'll go, can you get across the street? And he'll go, yeah. Tell him what for the car is. I noticed that with him. That worries me. But for Larry, this is a long way from being in a coma. I thought I, I was going to be out of it forever. After I realized what happened to me, I thought I was going to be out of it forever. Are you excited that you see you're starting to make Yeah, it? I'm real excited that I'm doing so well. Larry went home six days ago, and he's doing well, considering the degree of his injuries. He continues to return to the hospital for rehabilitation as an outpatient. His senseless beating helped raise an outcry against violence in the Delaware Valley, and his family hopes that as Larry gets on with his life, his story might make others think twice about the harm they can do. And there's another positive note. Ten years ago, Larry might not have had this opportunity to improve so rapidly. Rehabilitation medicine is a growing specialty that's making miracles like Larry's far more common because it forces people to take part in aggressive therapy. Now, tomorrow, we'll take a look at how victims of violence deal with disability years after they're attacked and how the healthcare system responds to their needs.
Moss does a great job. All right, wonderful. You mentioned mental ability. Any psychological treatment that might be necessary for, for a kid like Larry and the cost of that? Well, he can have continuing um, work with the mental work on that edge, but the other problem that occurs is when you have that kind of damage to the brain, you change your personality because there's actual areas in the brain that affect personality, and those changes may be permanent. As far as dealing with the fact he was attacked, they can help him with that. Mm -hmm. The other stuff, it's going to be tough to tell. Okay, thanks, Brian. Thanks, sure. And for a great deal of the violence that leads to murder and life-altering injuries. In fact, more than two-thirds of the homicides in this country are the result of people using firearms. Tonight, in part two of his series, The Cost of Violence, Dr. Brian McDonough takes a look at the long-term effects of guns. Well, Rich, as you can imagine, the long-term effects can be devastating. You're about to meet two people who had their lives dramatically altered by a single gunshot wound. The effects can be seen not only in their own disabilities, but in their families and the health care system. Unlimited time and resources are necessary to help them through their rehabilitation. I was sitting, eating chocolate ice cream on the boardwalk, and a man came up behind me and shot me in the back of the neck. Eileen Myers did not know the man who shot her 18 months ago. Apparently, she looked like his wife. The complete story is not known because within minutes, the gunman walked down the boardwalk and shot himself. I'll tell you, it rips me apart. I'm you know, I, after all, she's 33 years old. And if I have to feed her, it, you know, it just takes, takes a, it rips you. I feel like crying, you know what I mean? One act of violence can affect many. Since most of the folks that we're seeing with this problem are relatively young, many of their uh, parents are either at retirement age or approaching retirement age, and it, it disrupts several generations. So what does a person like Eileen do? How does she move on with her life? The first step is learning about her injury. Well, her injury uh, was a uh, partial interruption of spinal cord function at the C4 level. The spinal cord is a delicate network of nerves that sends electrical signals through the body. Without these signals, muscles don't work, vital senses like touch and pain perception disappear, and everything we take for granted fails us. Spinal cord injuries are a major result of our epidemic of violence. That's why Eileen's second step is so important. That step is rehabilitation. I think rehabilitation offers the only hope for these po uh, people because if they don't participate in a, an aggressive rehabilitation program, their medical needs will not be addressed. The problems that are known to be preventable won't be prevented. That's really good. Eileen's therapy includes regular stretching and strength testing of her muscles. Every potential sign of improvement needs to be recorded and there is a constant mm -hmm. battle to not lose any function that has already been salvaged. Eileen cannot walk, but she is being fitted for a new wheelchair that will respond to her commands. The focus of rehab is to try and make the patient as independent as possible. What Eileen and hundreds of thousands like her are just learning is the healing process from violence takes years. Joe Davis was shot 14 years ago in a domestic dispute. Paralyzed from the waist down, he says the rehab process never ends. He says in many ways, he's just 14 years old. After his initial therapy, the role of rehab was to provide him with educational and psychological support. With an accident like this spinal cord injury, it's like, you know, being, being born again. And I don't mean in the biblical sense. I mean uh, being born again because you have to learn um, how to, 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 to live all over again, train your, your bladder, your bowel. The nerve damage has affected Eileen's ability to control her bladder. Just one more problem she faces. But Eileen knows her battle is just beginning. They've been giving me good therapy here. Um, right now I can just move my right arm a little bit. And I can move my right leg a little bit. But they said um, it may take two or three years to get more return back. It's a courageous lady. Both Eileen and Joseph are learning to cope with their disabilities and they're fighting back. The disturbing part is that one gunshot fired in a split second has irreversibly altered both of their lives. Not all injuries are a result of firearms. Tomorrow night, we'll take a look at victims of blunt trauma and how emergency rooms have to deal with it. That urgent care in the initial stages is so dramatic as well and it's also a major cost in, in this battle against violence with health. Mm.
Thanks, Doc. Sure. Thanks, Brian. It's called the golden hour. That's what doctors say about the first 60 minutes that a patient spends in a hospital emergency room. The golden hour is particularly critical for victims of violence. Tonight, our Dr. Brian McDonough continues his series called The Cost of Violence with a look at how emergency rooms deal with violence. Well, Rich, the initial approach to a violence victim is critical. The decisions made during those crucial first few minutes after the attack can determine how quickly the patient can recover, or even if he or she lives or dies. There's a lot at stake. However, as you'll see, emergency room personnel are often left putting together the pieces of a mystery. The roar of an approaching helicopter signals the beginning of another busy night at Cooper Hospital in Camden. Sir, we're going to go into a big room. We're going to take pictures of you. Friday night is typically the busiest night of the week for most Delaware Valley emergency rooms. And this Friday proves no exception. It causes interpersonal violence. Uh, a shovel, shovel to the head, looks like the sharp end of the shovel entered the left portion of the scalp forehead and uh, caused multiple fractures, multiple bleeds in the head itself. Hi, this is Kathy Leopold calling from Cooper Hospital. As is the case with many victims of violence, particularly street fights, this patient is a John Doe. He is carrying two wallets with two different names. Nurses must try to track down the victim's next of kin through the police department. The last number stored in his beeper is the only clue to his identity. He came to us unconscious with the skull wide open and his face was pretty much crushed as well. With the skull exposed, every second is critical. A team of doctors works to stabilize the patient and prepare him for surgery. It's a routine they've been through many times before. In 1992, there were 1.7 million victims of violent crime treated in United States emergency rooms. But those cases represent less than 2% of the almost 90 million ER visits reported that year. Their numbers seem trivial, yet those 2% are responsible for an estimated $4 billion in health care costs each year. Dr. Bill Dalsey is in charge of the emergency room at Einstein Hospital, which receives tens of thousands of ER cases annually. Dalsey says only 4% of those are violence-related major trauma cases, but they require the lion's share of resources. On a percentage basis, it's a relatively small amount, but people who are major traumas require an extraordinary number of people to take care of them, and so they consume a large amount of resources. This man was brought to Einstein after being hit with a baseball bat during a bar fight. His injuries are not life-threatening. But his brazen talk of revenge, even before the police officers who brought him here, indicates this cycle of violence is not yet over. Dude accused me of taking somebody's keys when I didn't take them. I'm going to get him, I swear to God. It's incidents like this that often lead to more serious attacks motivated by revenge. Simple fistfights are a thing of the past. I think that the expectation on the street is different. I think that people will have more weapons and are more prepared to use their weapons. It's more accepted that if you're going to get in an altercation that you can severely injure somebody and it's expected. He's the hospital, he's bleeding. Where's he at? He's at St. Please at the church. When Eddie Paula came into our department, the physicians that have been here have seen all sorts of injuries all sorts of trauma patients and yet they were particularly affected by his injuries because they were so severe and they seemed so senseless. Certainly it makes you very close to death and how things could change for people. But for every Eddie Pollock who dies in the name of violence, Ow. Oh, yes. there are countless others who must live forever scarred. The young man who was struck with a shovel in Camden will likely spend the rest of his life recovering. We've had to take a lobe and a half of his brain out to prevent the whole brain from dying. He will survive it. How he'll function, we don't know. The amazing thing is that in an area the size of the Delaware Valley, these scenes are repeated dozens of times a night. Now tomorrow we're going to take a look at some scientific studies that deal with why certain people may be more violent than others. I think you'll be surprised at what we find. You know, it's interesting, the District Attorney of Philadelphia, Lynn Abraham, has been talking about 
over and over how baseball bat beatings are so traumatic and she talks about other than gun violence and we're seeing this in your series it's not just knives and guns out there knives it's, and guns obviously are a severe problem but the problem is people are violent and that is causing these difficulties and it's now spreading I, I talked to a psychiatrist who said it's spreading throughout society and it seems to build and just feed on itself and that's the real concern yeah. all right doc it's thanks. disheartening sure. okay thanks Brian.